Hello, Tatiana Mahmood. Thank you so much for coming to chat about AI video cast today. You're an anthropologist, an innovator, a board advisor, a mom, so many different things you're in, in the midst of. And I'm so excited that you can chat with us about not just where AI is today, but really where we're going in the next few years, because that's the question everyone has. So tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of what you see out there. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Vicki. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, I We talked a little bit uh, beforehand. We have so much in common. Maybe that'll come out in this podcast. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, as you said, I'm an anthropologist. So I'm an anthropologist who's been working here in Silicon Valley in San Francisco in tech companies, um, large and small little ones like Amazon and Salesforce, um, as well as, you know, slightly bigger ones like being the chief product officer at Nextdoor for that transformation in order to prepare it for the IPO, uh, Pendo, building a new future work platform. And recently, I've been on a couple of different boards, technology uh, company boards, um, SAT, mostly SaaS, um, software as a service uh, tech companies, um, but also advising a lot of AI startups, um, especially in this era of generative AI. And some people ask, why is an anthropologist interested in tech? Well, the short answer is that technology has always been a part of anthropology. Um, humans created technology, humans have used technology to help us evolve ourselves. And the evolution of humanity cannot be understood without understanding how technology works and how technology is created. Technology cannot be understood without really grappling with what are the human dimensions that are driving technology and innovation, that are driving the types of questions and concerns that technology startups you know, need to grapple with. And if a technology startup does not understand the human dynamics and the cultural dynamics uh, that are going on, they're probably not going to be very successful. And that's why a lot of AI startups and a lot of AI founders, as well as, you know, venture capital firms and private equity firms, um, you know, value my perspective because I really understand the human and cultural dimension of what's driving value in the technology space. And so that's what I do. And that's that's incredible. And driving value is what business is all about, right? It's about creating new value using technology as a tool or many other ways. Um, tell us a little bit about this. You know, I think 2023 saw an explosion of Gen AI in terms of content creation. Tell me a little bit about what you saw with the startups you advised and, and just out there in general. Yeah, so it was really interesting. What happened in November of 2022 when ChatGPT uh, came out, well, GPT 3.5 came out, right? Um, and it was made public, uh, you know, to everybody to try out and kick the tires. And there were two responses that people had, one of which was like, oh, AI, this is nothing new. We've had AI for over a decade. This is nothing new. And the other response was, oh my God, this is going to change the world. Uh, the sky is falling and all of our jobs are going to go away. Okay. So, and both of those are kind of right. And here's why. Um, so yes, we've had AI for over a decade, but the type of AI that most businesses were actually using and that all of us were familiar with was predictive and domain specific AI. Right. And so when I was at Salesforce in 2014, 2015, we started building Einstein. Right. So we did like lead, you know, intelligent lead scoring with AI. We did, you know, best next step recommendation, you know, based on past opportunities, you know, again, with predictive domain specific AI. That was a lot of the ML work. Right. That was being done. Um, <clears throat> what really why chat GPT was interesting and so uh, different is because it just leapfrogged. It like didn't do like <laughs> predictive general AI or general predict, you know, like or um, domain specific, uh, you know, uh, general AI, right? Or domain specific generative AI, right? It just leapfrogged. It went to generalized, right? 
and generative. Exactly. So it was a completely different paradigm. So some people were looking at it from the point of view of like, oh, it's just AI, right? Right. <laughs> um, and and some people were looking at it like, oh my God, this is not like even, this isn't like even on the trajectory of the AI that we've seen, right? It's not an expansion of the AI that we've been doing. It's something completely different. And both of those perspectives were correct. But what happened in 2023 is we started using you know, through the interface of basically the, the open box prompt mechanism to be able to generate so much content. And so 2023 was the year of people freaking out because all of the typing things that humans do at work can now be done faster for sure, and oftentimes better than humans do it. So those people who were seeing that this typing, creating content thing was part of, was the big, biggest part of their job sure. were, you know, freaking out. Okay. And the people who were managing or a little bit further removed from the typing things, <laughs> you know, type of work, um, were not freaking out. They were looking at like the fact that this is, you know, this is just another form of AI. And I think that what's happening now is that we're going, well, two things. The first is that there's, we're taking that generative capability and bringing it down into domain specific use cases. So that, and that's where most of the startups that I advise are at actually, is that they're taking that generative AI capability that you see in, you know, uh, in chat GPT or in Claude, and they're bringing it into a, dom a specific domain. Um, and by having it in a specific domain, you can do a lot of things like bring down the number of hallucinations dramatically right? Because now you can, you know, fine tune it or do rag, you know, based on the right. domain that you're, that you're talking about, you can have intelligent workflows based on a business process, right? With the generative AI. So that's where most of the startups are today. What's going to happen next in 2024 is that we're going to move from merely content generation and filling in the blanks in terms of those domain specific uh, workflows with generative AI, and we're going to have more agentive decision-making AI. So AIs that don't just create the content based on human-generated prompts, right? <laughs> which is where we are mostly yeah. today, yeah. but AI that actually makes decisions about what types of prompts and what types of you know, um, directions are best to take next in a particular workflow and actually does things beyond generate content. Hmm. So, you know, like so conclusions uh, or guide us on, on the specific decision, which is exactly. So it's going to be more decision-making AI. Now the laws are still a little bit um, prohibitive in terms of having the liability of a bad decision still on the humans within the organization. Mm -hmm. And so there would still be some need for super human supervision of AI decisions. But my question is when AI becomes just so much more effective at decision-making, to what extent will people just be clicking the, <laughs> checking the box? <laughs> right. And or well, will they really so easy, be right? Like, oh, does this look OK? And we're like, sure. Yeah. Right. Like who wants to do the extra thinking? <laughs> right. It reminds me of we already see that with content. Right. When somebody, you know, just cuts and pastes something out of chat GPT. And again, in the non-domain specific context, just paste copies and pastes it into something doesn't really check it, doesn't really do the due diligence to check whether it's correct and submits it. Right. But if you have domain specific AI that's trained on a particular workflow, you're probably far more confident that it's probably correct. So right. are people really going to check it or are our natural lazy inclinations going to take over and we're going to have AI making more and more decisions or actually supervising? And what that really means is that the AI is supervising humans because it's right. suggesting something to them. 
and they just say okay. Yeah, because and we're already seeing that in contact centers, right? As people interact with uh, and try to solve a problem, AI is overseeing their response, and it's like, well, show more empathy. Well, how about you suggest this? What about that? So it really takes away that agency, and you don't really have it's like stuff. Before a boss might be watching you as they walk by, but now it's a hundred percent of the time. There's someone influencing how you communicate, how you do your job, and it's no longer humans supervising AI. It's AI supervising humans, which is it. It's happening so quickly. I don't think we're realizing the change is already there. I completely agree. Everybody's branding these things co-pilots. Right. But at what point, is, when the co-pilot tells the pilot which button to press and what to do and which direction to turn the plane, yeah. To who's got more power, the pilot or the co-pilot? And then the security implications to that co-pilot, right? Making those decisions and writing that code could be even higher, right? Like because it's again not being double, triple checked. Um, it, it becomes even more important. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a for anybody who has not watched the movie War Games or not watched it recently. Yeah, you watched it, Vicky, right? You've seen yeah. it. So, yeah. so just rewatch it because the first ten minutes of the movie are amazing, um, and they're actually much more amazing now than, than it was back in 1983, because it really shows you how when AI basically what are really the human um, powers and skills and how does human intuition play into good decision-making? And if you take human intuition completely out of, you know, of the workflow and of the decision-making process, what could happen? And we can get into a little bit more what I really think the beginning of the, because the movie actually starts with them talking about a woman doing Reiki on her plants and the plant growing faster. That's actually how the movie starts. And there's a long conversation about energy work in the beginning of the movie. And then these two guys go into the, the new, you know, the nuclear silo yeah. and they have to make a decision about whether to, you know, or they don't, you know, the AI makes a decision, right. About, you know, whether, or they have to make a decision based on an AI prompt, um, about whether to, to launch nuclear weapons. And the human intuition is what saves them and helps them make a good decision. Um, but, and the whole movie is about, is that good or is that bad? Is that desirable? Is that undesirable? Um, but I do think that there's something really telling with how the movie starts. And it really shows us potentially, and I don't want to read too much into this movie. It's just that I'm, I, this is my interpretation of the movie because I already had this idea, obviously is what are the real critical human skills that will still continue to be present in an AI driven world? So even when AI is, you know, has more and in, more information, more data, even when it's more intelligent than human beings, you know, what will humans actually be really good at and much better than any machine at in the future can do? Um, that maybe we've forgotten, or maybe we don't realize that machines, at least in the near future, won't be able to do. So let's talk about the, what humans can do, because I know you want me to kind of like, I, you know, energy and the stories, you know, humanity so has developed so differently than the machines, right? And that, that's also what makes us very special and, and really identifies our strengths. So tell me more about, you know, how you're thinking about this as machines become better and better, right? With time, how do we become better and better as humans? So let me just pose this in an anthropological context. In an anthropological context, the current trajectory of computers is our machines that have been born in the industrial revolution. And the industrial revolution was a very particular context of both mechanistic and entirely materialistic concepts of science, as well as extraordinarily materialistic concepts of economics and society. Okay, so the types of machines that the humans can build many types of machines. It just so happens that computers are machines that are both mechanistic 
and entirely materialistic and driven by materialistic incentives because of the particular context in which they were developed, which is the industrial society and the industrial economy. Okay. You can, I'm just posing that because there can be other types of machines. Okay. So, and so what we have right now is we have a type of trajectory and a type of path dependence where computers and the AI that's being developed is going to be very good at the things that the industrial society and the industrial economy valued, right? Which are things like materialistic math, right? Which are things like generating very particular forms of knowledge and content, right? That we have valued because that's how we've built these things. That's what we've optimized them for, right? As the creators of them. Um, And so that there's a path dependence there in terms of what they're going to be getting better and better at. But remember, humans have other things, right? Other, like we haven't always lived in industrial societies. Maybe that's not the entirety of our um, particular skills. And so, you know, I think that there's an incredible opportunity and I'm really excited about this particular opportunity is for AI to take over the, a lot of the jobs and a lot of the tasks really like it's not even jobs. It's a lot of the tasks that industrial society has optimized for, because remember we were the machines in an industrial society and economy. And then we built machines to do the things that we used to do, right? Humans were cogs in the wheel in factories. And then we created robots to be the same types of cogs in the wheel to replace humans. And now humans are cogs in the wheel in a lot of knowledge work jobs. And so we're creating machines or AI to replace these cogs in the machine or cogs in the wheel again, right? So we're replacing humans as cogs in the machines of the current industrial complex. And so what does this mean? This means that humans are uncogified, if I can use that term. Once <laughs> we are, <laughs> it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. And so now we are going to have a, I mean, a lot of people are going to have a serious crisis, which is, I don't know how to do anything other than to be a cog. Yeah. And so now, how do I I, move into something different? How do you find, how do you measure value, right? It goes value and purpose. Like, how do I feel that I have purpose if I'm not doing what I've done for the last 20 years? You know, exactly. And so the question (laughs) is now, so what else can humans do other than create emails and create spreadsheets and do math and code? What are other, or create art? right? What are other things or write poems, right? What are other things that humans can do? <clears throat> well, we have to look beyond industrial society to answer that question. And I would say, if we look back to, let's just, there was a, there was a period in history that a lot of us know about because there's been a lot written about it um, in India around the time of Buddha, right? So about 2,500 years ago in the Middle East around the time of Jesus, right? In the Roman conquest. So again, around 2,500 years ago, around 2,000 years ago. Um, and also we, we have, you know, a lot of evidence from the Americas, especially from South America about things that were happening, you know, thousands of years ago. And all of those, all of those places, what's interesting is that, people were telling very similar stories about how they were tapping into energy work and intuition. You know, we had people healing others with their hands. We had mystical traditions. And there was something that humans were able to do, some other technologies that people were using and and developing that we have completely lost. And not only have we lost them, but within the last 200 years in industrial society, we have believed that those stories are all lies. Yeah. And I'm like, why do we think these stories are very similar? So do you think that the stories from the Middle East and the stories from 
India and the stories from, you know, South America are all so similar, but they're all lying. Like how probable is that? Yeah. Or is it that we've forgotten something in our desire and in our kind of move to be so materialistic and to be so mechanistic that we've lost all of this knowledge. We've lost a good portion of our human talents. And now we get to rediscover them. That's incredible. And just the strength of the social connection, right? And the energy we feel. I mean, there's, I, I've read a, a book re recently about how our brains can actually like some, you know, connect to other people. Like we're connected actually with our brains, which is kind of, I think is very interesting. Depending on the people around us, we think differently. So there, the brain might be ma made out of the same matter per se, but how our mind works, our mind evolves very differently depending on the situation and the people we're surrounding ourselves with. So I think so, that's kind of where you're going a little bit as well, is that we actually have to change our mind. <laughs> that's right. So um, <clears throat> the person to read on this subject is Rupert Sheldrake, um, and okay. he writes about morphic resonance fields and about the, the power of the fields. Um, I actually, my dissertation was actually based on this as well. It was based on practice theory. And in it, part of the part of the question in practice theory, because I was studying the Russian socioeconomic transition, and one of the big problems in sociology and anthropology is always which has more power, you know, the individual or the structure, right, or society. Right. And in practice theory, there's a really interesting thing where they they talk about it as um, the field, right? So the, the and it's larger than just like the social structures, but it's really the field within the cultural field um, within which someone operates. And then there's habitus, which is how the individual behaves, right? Mm -hmm. And makes decisions um, within, but it's structured by the field, right? Or it's structured by society and culture. And in my dissertation, part of it was to say that the actual agency yeah. is held by the field. Like fields change and then they change humans and humans who do not fit into the new field find themselves depressed. They find that they are less successful. They find that they are no longer, their knowledge is no longer relevant, but it's because the field has changed. It's not because they're any dumber or they're any, and then nothing is wrong about them. It's just that because the field has changed, they find themselves out of position. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> and so this is to say that, yes, like what is happening right now is that we are creating, the field is transforming. The field, you know, the field had transformed in the industrial revolution to take all of our, like sap <clears throat> the power and the credibility of non-materialistic, non-mechanistic knowledge and the people who, you know, still had mystical and spiritual beliefs were like relegated into, you know, secret societies or, you know, they were kind of cast off, you know, mm -hmm. as people who are irrelevant to the advancement of humanity, like monks and nuns, are they very relevant to the advancement of humanity today? Not as much as they were, you yeah, know, in, yeah. in eras in the past. And so, and those people were cast off as irrelevant. Sure. Um, and now <laughs> the field is shifting again because the, you know, because the power that humans are going to have to shape the world is going to maybe come from rediscovering the things that we have forgotten. Hmm. So, you know, it's imagining in the future, it's incredibly positive. You know, there's always that. I think that's what we're missing because as humans, we're so built to use stories to kind of create our reality in many ways and our beliefs. Um, we're kind of, we need to create new stories around how we can coexist with AI and what that means. That doesn't involve, you know, 
AI coming in and, you know, taking away all the jobs and killing all of us or manage, like, how do we create this, to your point, this great energy, this opportunity for humanity that kind of evolves itself, right? Um, Instead of just kind of a doomsday scenario that a lot of it is presented with. Well, I think that if we, well, the, the first challenge I would say is the fact that if we have a purely, um, if we have an AI that is not just incapable of doing anything other than materialistic and mechanistic things, um, or materialistic and mechanistic knowledge uh, production, and if it does not understand the value of anything else, we might be in trouble. Yeah. Okay. And we can see this with humans, right? Humans who are crass materialists and capitalists do not good, do good things to other humans, to the environment, to society, right? Yeah. So we have an example where we don't want to build, we need to build some way for AI to love and value the aspects of humanity that it may not even understand. Okay, so that is step one. And if we don't do that, we may be in big trouble. Yeah. Okay, so that is that I think is true. However, if we do do that, then we have a potential trajectory of having an incredible, I call it multi sapiens future. Mm. Right. So right now we have homo sapiens. Yeah, we have computers, but we don't have true agentive AI. So what happens when we have an intelligent, you know, species, right, right, that is making autonomous, fairly autonomous decisions, right? Can we have, can we actually move toward a multi sapiens future, a world in which we have multiple intelligences, and where each intelligence values the type of intelligence that the other has? Right. So we will probably value already like AI's ability to make better decisions and do better medical mechanistic medical diagnoses. But will AI value the ability of humans to sense the emotional context within that within which that medical diagnosis is being made? Or will AI value the fact that human like a human Reiki master can actually heal something potentially better? than some mechanistic intervention, Mm. right? Or will AI value the fact that that like a cut, right? Yeah, Yeah. we have to kind of build it in. Yeah, or will AI understand that perhaps if somebody, if it's diagnosing someone with depression, that maybe having someone cuddle with that person for the next month, you know, (laughs) is the best. source of yeah yeah is the best source of um of intervention as opposed to prescribing drugs that will alter their brain yeah so can we actually build this multi-sapiens future where we again remember that human intelligence is much larger than doing math and writing code and you know, writing the types of things and doing the types of science mm. that we have been doing for the last two hundred years, and have for, and and basically forgotten all other types of science that humans had been doing um, before that. Yeah. Um, can we build a different way forward? And can we remember what it means to be fully human, not just half human? Wow. You, I love that. Can we remember how to be fully human? Oh, right. That's so powerful to me. I think so. AI I is AI is just a reflection yeah. of the half humans that we have been optimizing ourselves to be for the last two hundred years. Yeah, <laughs> and now it's going to be a better reflection oh, of that. Yeah. Well. Tatiana, I hope so. I, I, I love that future. I mean, I as a person who, who very much leans on her intuition and is very much about feelings uh, a lot of the times, um, 
to me, that makes a lot of sense. It's something I'm willing to embrace. And I think it's, it's something that we need to allow our children to embrace, right? As the new generation kind of coming up, it's going to be very important for them to also find that other level of humanity that's inside them, right? Exactly. And not just exactly. Due to their machines and their devices and their video games and everything else that has become such a big part of their world. That's right. So I'm going to tell the story that last summer, um, you know, it was summer of 2023, and I'd signed up my kids for summer camp um, right before ChatGPT came out in November of 2022. And I had signed up for coding camp because, of course, there are great coding camps here in the Bay Area. And then ChatGPT came out and I played with it for about a month or two. And then I said, forget it, kids. You're not going to coding camp. And I signed them up for speech and debate and sailing camp. Mm -hmm. And why those two? Well, speech and debate, because I want them to learn how to express themselves, right? And to develop, you know, and there's something about being a really effective public speaker where you, you sense the energy of the audience and you reflect that energy back and you learn how to communicate well with other people, Absolutely. you know, and it's, it's beyond the words that you say, right? It's, it's how you express yourself. And then the sailing, there's something about sailing and on being on a sailboat where your body senses the wind and the motion of the waves and how the, you become kind of one with the boat, right? This is like getting your sea legs or whatever, sensing, sensing the ocean in your body and using your body as an instrument for decision making. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's also adjusting to change, right? Because the wind could change on a whim and you have to readjust your sails. And I feel like that the entropy, the, the, the speed of change is increasing so quickly that we're just not well built to just adjust. It's uncomfortable, it's super uncomfortable. So if you can make yourself comfortable with just the wind to your point changing and you're just kind of, hey, I'm going with it. It's just a new way it's flowing right now, right? And sometimes you don't, it, analyzing the instruments and just looking at the instruments isn't gonna be the best way to learn to sail. Yeah. Right. Looking at the numbers on the instruments is yeah. not the right. And, and the sailboats that they teach kids on have no instruments. And that's for a reason, because you need to learn how to sense the ocean and the wind and the waves and the boat through your body. And that type of knowledge, that type of intelligence is something that AI is not going to be close to doing. It, it will have the instruments. Yeah. But will it be able to sense the ocean? Will it be able to feel the wind the same way that the human body can? I love it. I hope you write, I hope you write some stories for all of us to read and share in terms of what that future looks like. Because I think we've just gotten so far away from it that it's sometimes hard to come back to and just kind of reimagining the future where we sense more and maybe do less, you know, less of a hustle culture that we've all embraced <laughs> um, will be huge. Yeah. And less, I mean, I think that the, and less looking at spreadsheets, right? Like you're, <laughs> none of us should ever spend any time looking at spreadsheets. The AI yeah. should be able to, able to tell us whatever we want to know. Yeah. Um, and all the, like all these things that, that we have spent so much of our lives trying to yeah. optimize and trying to learn in school. And, but just think about all the things that we haven't learned. Think about all the things that our ancestors knew and were able to do. And most of us haven't learned. There's a huge opportunity for that. Mm. And even learning new skills, expanding on something that, that we can't even imagine right, right now. So. Exactly. Wow. Amazing. Well, I, I'm, this has been an incredible discussion. It made me think in a very, very different way. I love how you bring your anthropology and your tech background together into this complete like 
picture of what the future is, because that's the future is changing. And I think Tatiana, you're one of the best people to advise on what's about to come. Thank you so much. Thank I'm so much really, yeah, I'm really looking forward to having this multi sapiens conversation um, and not thinking narrowly about, you know, the issues based on what we know today, but really understanding the full depth of humanity and what our potential is. I love it. I'm looking forward to it. We'll have to get together in a year or two and see how how much it has all changed because I think it's going to be even more different. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. This was awesome. Thank you for inviting me, Vicki. Thank you. If you would just... Um...